Welcome back to another episode of the Cool Your Jets podcast. I'm your host, Ben Blessington, with Michael Nania, and we have a very special guest this week. Thomas Hennessy, the long snapper, is here to do an interview and a film session. Uh, so we're pretty excited about this one. Michael is obviously a big uh, Thomas Hennessy fan. Um, your consistency, Thomas, is, is pretty impressive. So Michael has had a lot of analytics and articles written about you. So yeah. we're excited to, to talk to you uh, and, and get to look at some film. But really quickly, uh, how are you doing with the quarantine and, and staying indoors? Yeah, th- uh, thanks a lot for having me on. I've definitely seen some of Michael's posts. Um, they're, ni- they're nice to see. They're a small little ego boost sometimes when I, I see him come across. <laughs> that my that is just feet. awesome to hear. <laughs> yeah. And um, but quarantine uh, is going well. Everyone in my family is luckily been safe and healthy. Um, and in terms of working out in football, I've been working out in my childhood friend's garage up in Rockland County, New York. And uh, so I've been able to lift weights and stay in shape and um, train the fields here in New Jersey to snap and run. So it's been going well. That's all. Are you with your, your brother, Matt, who just got drafted uh, a few weeks ago? He is. He's living at home um, because he already graduated from Temple. So he's living up there, and we coordinate times. We go and lift at different times. That's uh, awesome. So there's not too, too many of us in there at the same time. But yeah. Well, what was that like being with him when, when he got drafted? Obviously, it was, a, it was a weird situation this year. But was it – I mean, a lot of Jets fans were hoping that he was going to end up in New York. I mean, obviously, he goes down to Atlanta, but still a great situation for him. What was that like kind of just watching the draft with him? Yeah, it was amazing. Um, we had a draft – a little draft party at the house. There were less than 10 of us there, just really immediate family. Um, but it was, it was so awesome to see all his hard work um, over the past seven or eight years through high school and college – come to fruition when he got the call uh, I was undrafted um, so it was really cool to see him kind of you know get drafted and see it pop up on tv uh, it was incredible and we were just so proud of him well, well you mentioned that you were undrafted but you were traded for which does show that you did have some value early on in your career what was that like yeah. the, the day that you heard you were traded from from the Colts to the Jets yeah that was uh, certainly a little surprising uh, being traded as an undrafted long snapper is pretty uncommon I think it was like the first time it had happened since maybe 2009 or something uh, I saw at the time. But um, it was after the third preseason game uh, with the Colts. I got called into the general manager's office on Monday after the game. Um, and I thought I was being released. It seemed like that kind of – it had that kind of feel to it. And then I went into his office um, and he said, hey, we've actually traded you uh, to the New York Jets. And I kind of smiled inside. I was really happy that – one, my opportunity to play in the NFL was continuing. And then two, that kind of that I was going back home. Um, so about like four hours later, I was on a flight to Newark, um, came to Florham Park, had one practice with the team, and then played in the fourth preseason game. It was a whirlwind, but it was awesome. Yeah, and you mentioned coming back home to play with the Jets. And uh, you were born in Rockland County, as you mentioned, went to high school in New Jersey. So what are some, are there any negatives of playing in home in terms of like distraction, but, or is that something that uh, you're really cool with getting to be able to play in your hometown with the Jets? Um, overall, it's definitely, it's a positive plan at home. Um, the only small distraction I could think of is tickets. Uh, when you, <laughs> when you live in the area, there are more people um, that could possibly ask for tickets and you definitely want people to, you know, help friends and family come to the game. Uh, but we are limited. Uh, most people don't know players only get two tickets per game for wow. home games. Um, and then you buy the rest just at face value. Um, so it can add up, but it's definitely great to be able to have um, your close family and friends come to games. Yeah. And as we go into the season, you know, Matt Hennessy, your brother just got drafted, but the Jets also drafted, you know, later in the draft, uh, a new punter that you're going to be working with, Braden Mann. So, um, how hard is it to adjust? Um, you know, you ha- you only got to play with Lachlan Edwards these first few years. So uh, how much of an adjustment is there when you have to work with a new holder, a new, a new kicker, uh, just that overall, that group of three right there, uh, when there's any transition? Yeah, um, there is, there's a little bit of an adjustment. It's honestly, it's probably like, it's probably not as much of an adjustment as people think. Um, we are professionals. And, you know, through my time through rookie mini camps and through having different kickers and punters on the team in the off season, you do get used to snapping to different people. Um, so you kind of just, you're forced to be able to adjust as quickly as possible. Um, so it's really just about earning trust as you, with each other as quickly as possible. Um, and kind of, you have to trust the other person because sometimes you get to a team and 
Um, for, for example, a kicker who joins the team midweek, um, they need to trust that operation, even though they had never worked with it, um, because their opportunity is, is right there in front of them for that Sunday. Um, so you just kind of have to adjust. And ha- have you seen any of the highlights of Braden Mann? He's a, a record setter. He was a record setter at Texas A&M. I think he has a career distance record uh, in college football. So, you know, he's a, a really talented guy coming in. So do you know anything yet about him? Have you been able to talk to him yet? Um, I've, ju- I've just seen the little things on Twitter. I honestly don't know too much. Uh, I did reach out to him um, and I've talked to him a little and I've gotten a chance to see him in some of our virtual meetings with the Jets. Um, but yes, yeah, just still excited to get back to the facility whenever we can. And it's a lot, it's a lot better, obviously, to see everybody um, and actually practice with everybody in person. Yeah, it's pretty exciting um, from watching some of his work uh, at Texas, Texas A&M, just knowing that the Jets – you know, can really uh, pin teams deep inside their five and flip field position. And it really is going to, you know, create an emphasis. And when, when they are punting the ball, that they can really change the game. And, and so I'm excited to see what uh, the work that you guys do um, uh, this season. Uh, but obviously, it, it's a little weird. Um, you know, we don't know when you'll be able to go back to practice. But when you do have typical practices, so I guess the last three years of your career, what is a typical practice like for a long snapper, a punter, a kicker? Because obviously, you're not you're off to the side a lot of the times, and then I guess you're doing other special teams drills. So what, what is that kind of like, and how much time do you spend away, you know, from the rest of the team? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so during the week, during like a normal game week, I'll use as an example during the season, um, I snap three times a week, including game day, really. Um, so we have – so Monday is the day after the game um, where it's just really film and lifting, and we do all that together. Uh, meaning offense, defense, special teams. And then Tuesday is our off day. Wednesday is our big work day from a – has been our big work day from a special team standpoint where we kick and we punt. Um, so I'm snapping field goal and punt that day. And then uh, Thursday we're not kicking. Friday we are kicking. Um, Saturday's a walkthrough. And then Sunday, game day, ready to go. Um, but so during the week, it's really – the two days where I'm snapping, um, it's just getting ready for – for like 20 or 30 minutes of special teams periods where I have to be ready to go. And then the other, whatever it is, hour and a half to two hours of practice, it's with the coach, like working on drills. um, And then honestly, some downtime besides that. And then in terms of meetings, our meetings are a little shorter. We just go to really special teams meetings every day, uh, which can be anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour. And then we don't go to offensive and defensive meetings. So we're either, yeah, just hanging idly or meeting with um, our special teams coach. And your coach actually is a, a guy that we wanted to ask you about, Brant Boyer, who has done a really good job since he's come over to the Jets, really helping uh, to turn over a unit that was struggling in the past, but since he's come here, he's really turned it around. So what do you think are some of the things that make him such a great special teams coach? Um, I think, number one, um, that he played at such a high level on special teams for a long time in his career, and he just understands what players go through um, day in and day out and his ability to relate to the player and, and teach us wh- wh- when he's been in our shoes is, is pretty awesome. Um, his ability to like ask for feedback um, and adjust to the needs of specialists and special teamers. Um, and then the standard he sets is just very high. He definitely demands excellence from us every day. Um, the goal is to be the number one special teams every year. Um, so yeah, just like setting a really high standard and then being able to communicate and, understand um, how the player understands how to do exactly their job on every rep. And you mentioned the goal of being the number one special teams unit. How, how did, how did, how is that evaluated in terms of uh, what are some of the things overall that uh, Brant Boyer in particular and you guys are trying to accomplish when you're trying to be that top special teams unit? Yeah. So I guess, I mean, I know the way it's usually measured by the public is the, that DVOA stat yeah, that, yeah. that people see. I mean, we're not really looking at that. You can't really focus on a result. You have to focus on your process right. um, and then hopefully achieve the best result you can um, in, everything, in everything we do. That's we, when you get into trouble, you start just looking at the result. Um, so, I mean, it's just, it just really comes down to just focusing on, um, you know, for me, it's throwing a perfect snap, blocking, and then getting downfield to do as much as I can in coverage. Um, for punters, it's pinning the team on the sideline with with as much hang time as possible. Um, with you know, with gunners, it's making beating their man, making tackles, kick return, making your block. Um, so just every single person doing their job, and then hopefully you look up and then 
um, you do have the number one special teams. And we're going to talk about a lot of those things right now. We got uh, a bunch of clips here of you from this past season. You led long snappers with four tackles this past season, so we've got a few of them here to look at. So first Thanks, this guys. one uh, against – yeah, it's, it's really – it does not get enough respect. Uh, not just you, how good you are, but um, long snappers in general, their impact on the game. Yeah. So we got a few clips here of some of your best plays from the past couple seasons. First this one against Cleveland. Uh, you bring bring down Jarvis Landry here, and you can see he yeah. gets pretty frustrated uh, at the end of this play. So just just to start off, I want to ask you, what are some of the ways that play calling works uh, on special teams, particularly uh, because we're looking at punts here in the punting game? For you, what how do your roles differ from play to uh, from play to play in terms of coverage and your assignment getting down the field? Um, yeah, in co- in coverage, you know, my assignment is it, pretty simple. It's just like try to get down and affect the returner um in any way I can so you know it's going to be tough for me I, I'm you know I like to think, think of myself as pretty athletic in terms of running and getting downfield with some agility um you know some of the other guys who t- tackle for a living probably have slightly better tackling skills than me so I'm just getting down there in the open field uh, and trying to do anything I can to affect the returner whether that's divert him um or hopefully tackle him or like here it's kind of an open field to just like dive and get as much as I can on them to affect them. And what are some of the things that you guys in the film room and Brant Boyer that you're looking at on film uh, to try to try shut down other teams punt return, uh, just punt return units in general? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I guess we just look, it kind of starts, um, you know, with a good punt, you want good hang time and good direction. And then um, into from a, from the other 10 guys on the field, the two gunners and all the interior. Um, we're just looking to space out and kind of uh, wrap the player in a net, basically create a coverage net um, where wherever they run, they're going to run into one of us and we each keep our own coverage lane. Uh, yeah, most teams, like pretty much all 32 teams are uh, pretty standard with that in the NFL. Yeah, you talk about your athleticism. You're, you're flying on that. Do, do you know your 40 time by any chance? Uh, I ran, um, I ran like a 4.9 coming out that pro day. Um, I mean, that, I think, that's pretty I think good. I play a little faster than that, but <laughs> I, I, don't, I mean, I, yeah, I just run as, I just give a lot of effort. I run as hard as I can. And I, I try to make hustle plays as best as I can. We definitely have some hustle plays coming up, but on this one, I was curious to get your thoughts on, on this isn't obviously is not on you. There's lack Edwards does get hit on this play um, from his left side. And so I was kind of curious before we get into to some of your parts uh, of this play, what exactly happens in a play like this? I mean, cause obviously you guys notice that there's three players coming um, from Lack's side. Uh, is this just a, a blocking, you know, a, a scheme issue? Do you guys know that Lack's going to have the time to get this off? Kind of what happens here? Can you kind of break it down as to why Lack gets hit on this play? Um, in terms of Lack getting hit, it's really at no fault of anybody, uh, like, on our team. It's really just kind of they bring two guys on that last man, uh, Terrence Brooks, number 23. They just right. kind of hit him with two guys. Um, that's just like kind of a good scheme by the Dolphins. And Locke does a great job of punting right over the middle. Um, so like, so I'm snapping the ball from the hash. He's offset to the left so that he can have an angle to the right. Um, and then he punts directly behind me because if say he, he punted a little bit to the left, that punt might've had more of a chance of getting blocked. Um, right. So yeah, it's just a good job by the Dolphins of, I mean, it's, it's almost like they weren't really even trying to block the punt. They just kind of roughed up our, our slot into lock, but he definitely had enough time to get the punt off. Yeah, and what are some of the keys to, to making a, a tackle? Because, you know, a punt is just a, a really unique situation, and, and the NFL has made a lot of, a lot of changes to special teams. You get the, the trip up tackle, you're pretty, pretty hyped up on that one. Yeah. The NFL has made a lot of special teams changes, especially on the kickoff returns, you know, due to safety, because it's really just two players fl- or two teams flying at each other. Um, but kind of what are some of the keys for you in, in the open field like this uh, to making this tackle? Yeah, uh, just getting – one, getting down there as fast as possible. And then, two, once you're down there, um, you want to kind of cut off the field of the returner. So right now, uh, Jakeem Grant for the Dolphins, he catches the ball, like, outside the numbers. Right. So he wants to take it to the field. He wants to get – in his perfect world, he'd probably stretch all the way to his right and then cut up the field uh, for a big return. Um, but we have several guys outside of him to force him back in. So that way we're covering a much, uh, much less of the field. We're covering like about, of a, about a third the field now instead of the entire field. Um, so it's cutting him off. And then once I get down there, just like kind of getting body control 
getting in front of them, um, and then doing the best I can to bring them down. And when you have to run, I mean, essentially the full length of the field, are you, are you pretty winded by the time you get down there? I mean, I, I, just, I mean, I can't imagine just fully sprinting, trying to tackle a guy like Jakeem Grant, who's like one of the shiftiest players in the NFL. But you, you yeah. make this tackle, I will say. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I mean, it is tiring. Um, like, if there was a penalty on the play and we'd have to go back and do it again, that'd be pretty unfortunate <laughs> for, for all of us. Uh, but, you know, luckily I, I go out there probably about 10 or 11 times a game. Um, so I just have to be able to do it like nine more times. Uh, and Michael, I, I, don't, I don't think Thomas was on the team when this happened, but Michael, maybe you can refresh my memory. In, in 2016 against the Dolphins, didn't they have – didn't the Jets like uh, – they, they kicked it off and then there was a penalty and the, the Dolphins had to redo it and then ended up taking it back for a touchdown? I, I believe that happened. Yeah, I, with, think, I with, think it was <laughs> I – I forget what happened, but you're right. It was something like that. I think they returned, they returned the touchdown the first time and then they redid it. Uh, so like everyone was just completely winded after that, but yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's gotta be tough to, to go out there again after sprinting down the entire field if, when there's a penalty like that. No, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, it definitely has an effect. And so this next pun here, a big part of your job uh, on the, in, on the punting unit is not just coverage, but uh, before the pun even gets off, you got to protect, make sure that pun doesn't get blocked. And uh, so just in general, what are some of the things that, uh, you're trying to accomplish uh, accomplish in protection. And on this play in particular, they kind of throw uh, what kind of looks like a stunt, like what you would see on defense from a defensive line uh, with yeah. uh, the guy on the right kind of comes down, the other guy's looping. So just in general, what are you trying to accomplish in protection? Yeah, sure. Um, so just like you pointed out about their stunt, um, yeah, I think if pe- most people don't really see because when you watch a game on TV, you get the sideline view. Right. Um, but I, I like that you guys take some of the extra time and are looking at the game film. But when you look at the end zone view, I think a lot of people would be surprised um, how complex some of the rushes can be on punt um, that the other team sets up. Uh, our job doesn't, isn't that complex. It's always kind of get straight back and block your man, um, like a man blocking scheme. So I'm just getting straight back. And right now I don't really have a man to block. The, the Browns are trying to set up a return. So he just hits me. It's called dumping the center. It's like a pretty common tactic where one, you can either, you get a chance at knocking me down um, and like knocking me out of the protection, knocking me out of the coverage or two, he knocks me back so that I can't set a pick for one of the guards, uh, number 56 or uh, 51, it looks like. Um, so yeah, right there, it's, they're like, they're obviously not trying to block the punt. They just want to set up a return and then they just kind of give me a quick pop at the line. So my job there is really just to kind of like stay up, keep my balance, and then get downfield. Yeah, and you talk about getting downfield. When do you kind of be like – when do you know that it's the right time uh, for you to, you know, pull out of protecting and then start getting downfield? Obviously, the punt, you know, once it's off, it's time uh, to go down yeah. and cover it. But just in general, when, are, when do you know that it's time for you uh, to be able to get out of protecting and go cover? Yeah, that's a good point because it is technically illegal for us to leave before the ball is punted. I think if you're more than like two or three yards down the field, you can get flagged for a penalty. Um, but most of the time, like I'm not getting to go back like completely free, meaning like either one, I'm not blocking somebody two, nobody's hitting me or three. I'm not setting a pick for anybody. So by the time any of those three things happen, it's probably time to release and get downfield. Um, so, I mean, just the number one job is to make sure I secure my block and make sure nobody is rushing the punt. And then once that is not happening, um, it's pretty much time to run downfield. And you mentioned a couple times setting a pick. What What do you mean by that when you're setting a pick? For you talked about the two guards next to you. Uh, when When you talk about setting a pick, what are you trying to get done there? Yeah, when you set a pick. Um, so right here, I'm kind of knocked back off their level. But if I was at the same level as my two guards, um, there's other film clips of it. But basically, I would like. I would take, I would hit the hip of the man that's trying to block number 56 right there. So then uh, 56 does a great job getting free himself, but um, I would hit his hip. So then the Browns player would get knocked off of him and then we kind of both get free. Um, So you kind of get a two for one to get downfield. Yeah. And you do get downfield on this play and this return was called back because of a block in the back, but uh, the tackle you make potentially saves a, a touchdown or a really long gain here. There's a big hole there, and you come in, dive, and make that tackle. So do you remember this play or um, how you were able to get this tackle accomplished? 
Yeah, yeah, I do. I remember. I think it was. Um, I think it was like Thursday night football. In yeah, Thursday night. Yeah, yeah. Very painful uh, game for us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That was tough. Um, but yeah, I just remember running downfield, and then kind of like we're we're spaced out pretty well right there. But then some kind of space opens up between fifty six and and me and myself. So I just run. To, I just like try to get back to close that space as much as possible and dive at it, dive low, because um, if you dive high, they probably have a better chance of breaking the tackle. So just dive low to take out a leg or an ankle. Um, and I remember just like he was pretty powerful coming down the hole. Uh, it definitely gave me a little shock to my head and shoulder. Um, but I was pretty happy to like look down and see that, look back and see that he went down after it. Yeah, no, no celebration that time, but but certainly a, a pretty yeah, good time. Yeah. I guess the penalty would have called it back. But um, uh, next, before we get into to exactly um, the, the play here, um, what are what's some of the criteria for for a perfect uh, snap, specifically on like a long snap like this? You know, like a basketball uh, shooter kind of has you know beef, like you know, says bend the knees, elbows, eyes, uh, follow through. Like, is there anything like that that comes from from a technical standpoint when you're snapping a ball like this? I mean, obviously this is a perfect snap, like most of the ones that we're watching. Um, yeah. But is there anything technically that that you have to remember every time that you're snapping a ball? Yeah, there's definitely cues you give yourself. Um, I know from like a sports psychology standpoint, you're not supposed to really ever give yourself more than two or three cues at once. So, I mean, at this point, like snapping the ball, you know, is second nature. Uh, but there's definitely a couple things I'll, I think of every snap and they kind of change. Um, it kind of changes like every game depending on how I'm feeling really. Um, but it, it, it'll be not just the snap. It'll be like the protection too. Uh, I'll be thinking of because um, you have to get up really quickly and do that. So that'll kind of be part of, you know, what I'm thinking, because like a basketball player shoots and follows through and that's really it. They might follow the shot for the rebound, but I'm like shooting, I'm like shooting, following through and then like getting hit by a 250 pound person. So, um, you yeah, know, it just, it's, it's kind of like what you said. It's like follow through and then, you know, get your hands up and stay low and block. Right. How much, how much would you say your long snapping technique has changed since you've gotten into the NFL? Like, I mean, as you said, it's, it's basically second nature to you. Um, so obviously you've been perfecting the, this, this form, this technique for practically your, your whole life. How much would you say that, that NFL coaching has adjusted it or is it pretty much just say the same? Um, I would say it's adjusted slightly over the years through college. Um, in college I was, I was a no look snapper. So I wasn't even looking back at the punter when I snapped it in, in like my, in the beginning of my NFL career, I was a no look snapper. Um, but then just kind of like over time I learned to look back at the punter it was a lot it was easier so instead of like not looking at the punter then looking at him then bringing my head back up I just go from looking at him to now just getting my head back up Um, and then I also snap probably less with my full body you see like a lot of younger snappers in high school and college they kind of completely lock out their legs so like my butt comes up to like use my hamstrings in the snap but um, I don't lock out all the way so that I have time to get it back up and and get up quickly to block. Right. I mean, it's not just the snapping. It's obviously the blocking and then getting down the field. And then we've talked a lot about your tackling. But when you're in this type of situation, obviously this is a guy in Darren Sproles who's made a living r- returning punts. Are you more focused on bringing him down? Or are you more focused when you talk about creating that net, kind of just slowing him down and allowing maybe some of the, the – not to criticize your athleticism, but maybe some of the more athletic you know, corners and safeties trying to get down the, the, down the field. What, what's kind of going through your mind when you have a dangerous returner like Darren Sproles? Yeah. Um, I mean, it is a good point you bring, like, you know, some of the, in terms of production, like, uh, I'm, I'm proud of my tackles, but some of the other players um, are definitely a little more athletic and better tacklers. Um, so it's just really doing my, you know, my 111th on the play, just like keeping my lane integrity, and then doing the best I can. I definitely, once I get down there, I'm definitely trying to bring them down. Um, right. But trusting your teammates, and knowing that there's, you know, 10 other guys covering the punt. Um, so as long as I, I cover my lane, you know, we'll get him down. Yeah. And this next one against new England, you talked about trying to make the tackle when you get down there, you, you get a pretty big hit in this play, uh, when you're able to get down there and make this tackle, uh, here you come right there from, Boom. from the, yeah. on the blind side there really it gave him a pretty big shot. Probably don't see that a ton from long snappers, but have you ever asked Jamal Adams for some hit stick tips, um, coming in, just giving a <laughs> tough shot like that? Uh, no, I, I haven't. Um, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. He's definitely a great tackler and lays some really, really big hits. Um, you know, it's tough to practice like the actual tackling in a practice, yeah. in, in a practice because we don't ever tackle in practice. Um, 
So, and I, I haven't been really, I didn't play defense in high school or college. So it's just kind of like, I'm just kind of going out there and just doing whatever I can to hit them hard and bring them down. Uh, but also at the beginning of this play is, is what it pi- is. There's a pick. Um, so right here, I set a pick for our left guard. Um, so I hit his hip and now we both get free. So now 55 was trying to mug up um, our left guard. So now I hit him and then not only does he get free, but now I'm free to get downfield and he's left behind. And then we, us two end up making the tackle. I think 47 starts it and then I assist. So when you set a pick like that, is that something that's kind of designed going in or because like right here, you're not really covered uh, 52 there. It doesn't even look like he, for new England, doesn't even look like uh, he was looking when that snap started, but uh, is that, yeah, Bill Belichick, kind of this, he gets this is just a sign that he's declining. <laughs> Belichick is, but uh, when you're uncovered, is it more like when you're uncovered and uh, you just don't really have someone to block that you'll make that kind of pick play? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It depends on the play, but if you're uncovered, there's definitely a chance you could be picking. And then coming down the field when you make this tackle, you mentioned you don't really get to practice it that much and that you didn't even play defense uh, before coming to the NFL or college. But uh, are, are you just kind of going down there, just doing the best you can to get, your, uh, to get in there and make that play? Or is there a target you shoot for? when you're making that tackle, you mentioned before when you made that diving tackle uh, against Cleveland that you're just trying to get low, trip him up by the ankles. Uh, is there a specific target you're looking to hit on a player's body when you're coming in, making a diving tackle, sort of like this one? Yeah. Um, I'm definitely trying to I err on the side of going low, but here he was kind of being held up already by 47. Um, it, it, it happens, pr- it happens pretty fast out there. Yeah. Um, so like, Right here, I see that he's kind of being brought down already. So I'm just trying to really hit him as hard as I can. It was like if somebody on the street, like, stole something from you and you need to chase him and tackle him, <laughs> you wouldn't, like, really think too much. You just kind of run and do it. Um, that's how I feel out there. But you definitely err on the side of going low. Yeah, we, we certainly see uh, that, that mentality in this next play. Um, uh, first of all, I guess I should ask, what exactly happens at the end of this? I don't know if you remember this. And I, I believe the Giants were your hometown team, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think uh, I remember. childhood team. But you yeah, get somebody, a little scrum here. Yeah, so in um, – <laughs> yeah, yeah. So on punt, one rule a lot of people aren't – I didn't even know until like, – I didn't even know this rule until I got to the NFL. But if we if, – if the kicking team, us, if we touch the ball before the receiving team gets a chance to touch it – so right here I touch the ball to down it um, before it can come back and we lose yards on it. So we, we touch the ball first. The Giants then could have a chance to come and pick it up and try and make a return with no consequence. So, like, it's pretty risky for them to come in and touch it, like, with a bunch of us around there. You'd imagine, right. like, they, they could have a muff or a fumble. Um, but if if they do have a fumble, the very worst result of the play is it goes back to where it was first touched by us. Um, so, it's like the rule of first touch. That's right. why, I like, you know, I used to always wonder, like, during a pooch punt, um, when the returner, when they, the returner is clearly not going to return it, but they still kind of, like, hover, hover down around there inside the 20 that's because they're waiting for the chance to maybe go for a first touch. Um, there was a play like with the Raiders and the Broncos in either 2019 or 2018, where Dwayne Harris picked up a ball that had been touched by the Broncos. It took it like 99 yards for a touchdown. Um, and that was like a perfect example of, of a receiving team exploiting the, the first touch rule. So that so was just that- Mike, the, yeah, sorry. Number 31, of the Giants trying to pick up the ball and make a play and, I, and me just taking him down to make sure nothing happened. <laughs> Yeah, you, you had to pretend like you're, you're out in the street and he, and he took uh, your wallet or something. Uh, are there other rules? I mean, you bring up a, a good point there that, that a lot of fans don't know about special teams, but specifically about downing punts. Are, are there a lot of rules or, or things that coaches are preaching um, that many fans probably don't think of when they're watching plays like these that, that immediately come to your mind? Um, because I didn't even really think about that, that he could pick that up and, and try to run with it. Yeah, uh, there are a lot of rules. We definitely spend a lot of time going over like situations. Um, that's pretty huge for your success because you never know when a weird situation is going to come up. And that, the NFL rules seem to kind of get a little more complicated every year. Um, but there's a lot of weird rules. One one kind of interesting rule is like on a kick return, if the if the kicking team kicks the ball near the sideline, the returner he can put one foot out of bounds, one foot inbounds, and touch the ball while the ball is still in bounds. And it counts as a kick out of bounds, and they, they would get the ball at the 40. Um, so that's kind of another weird rule. Yeah, I think, uh, I think your former teammate, uh, Ty Montgomery, actually did that with the Packers yes. a few years ago. Yeah, he did. Uh, yes, and, exactly. And then the other one is the, uh, the weird – I don't know if you're – well, I assume you're familiar with it since Brent Boyer is pretty rigid about the rules. But the, the, the free kick 
rule. I forget exactly how this works. Michael, do you remember if it's like, if it's at the end of the half or something? Yeah, I know. I, yeah, the free kick, is, if it's in within two minutes at the end of the half, you call a fair catch on a punt. Um, then you can basically take a kickoff like approach at the ball. Uh, I think you can't use the tee, but you have to use a holder. But then the other guys are covering the punt, and then you can try and kick a field goal. I think the Panthers, the Panthers and the Bucks had one last year, uh, and they missed it. But yeah, it's really interesting that that you know like uh, all these rules. Is this something that Brent Boyer? I mean, obviously you mentioned it, but is this something that Brent Boyer has really hammered down, knowing all these weird, unique rules that 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 nobody really even thinks about, and that they only come out maybe once once a season? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we every week we kind of go through plays of the week around the NFL, um, whether that's like a big return, a great block, you know, a critical block field goal, um, or just like a weird penalty or play. Um, yeah, you definitely want to know that. Um, and, you know, another one is like the blocking rules keep changing. So on on a kicking play, like you can't blindside block somebody. Um, like basically, you really can't do it at all if if you're going back away from the ball um, to block somebody, you basically almost have to like set a basketball pick with your hands up, you know, to eliminate kind of violent blocks. Um, so yeah, we watch those plays every week to be ready for different situations and just like to learn how the rules are being enforced every week. Is there anyone who stands out and you watch those plays that just keep showing up week after week, special team stars that aren't getting enough attention? Um, I mean, yeah, there's, there's, Definitely a lot of players around the – I mean, Rontez Miles has been great for us on yeah. special teams. Um, you know, Matthias Farley is great. Um, yeah, Basham. We had a lot of guys that did really good things on special yeah. teams. Um, around the league, I mean, there's, uh, there's like, some of the top special teams players that um, people refer to, like Matthew Slater on the, the Patriots, number 18. Um, I think Adrian Phillips on the Chargers. He went to the Pro Bowl as, like, a special teamer. Um, so, yeah, there's definitely players that kind of show up over and over again. Like, yeah. Man, as we look at this next play, um, the, the first few tackles that we've seen here, uh, as you said, um, most of the time you're just kind of trying to get down there as fast as you can. But uh, on this play, you do have to shed a block here. Uh, this guy from Miami tries to get in your way, but you're not having any of that. So uh, when it comes to shedding blocks when you're in coverage, uh, what's kind of your approach with that? Uh, again, like I asked about um, your tackle, uh, your target when you're tackling, uh, is there anything you're trying to do in particular when you're shedding a block, whether it's getting low, kind of using your hands to get off a block like a defender would, or is it mostly just trying to get down there, use your power, get off and make the tackle? Yeah, for shedding a block, um, the, I, like the, probably the main thing is you don't want to choose a side. So right there when that guy like goes to hit me, like the worst thing I could do would be try to avoid him and go to his right or left. So instead I just kind of like go right at him so I can keep my lane integrity. Right. I don't really let him like dictate to me which way to go. I dictate which way to go. I want to keep going vertical down the field to stop the returners vertical. Um, so yeah, it's just like not, not picking a side and then using your hands. You definitely, like you said, you definitely want to use your hands. And do you, do you ever study like tendencies of punt returners in particular, some things that they try to do? Uh, like for example, on this play, Miami, uh, you guys punt to the left uh, and then he catches on the sideline. Looks like he's trying to get, uh, and, and that actually, like like you just talked about, you're trying to establish a lane there, not pick a side, uh, and give him that room to run. Looks like, uh, I believe this is Jakeem Grant trying it to is. get on the yeah. sideline. Uh, so do you study tendencies of returners, what they're trying to look to do, to help you in those situations, uh, like you're trying to predict what they're going to do and make sure that uh, what they're trying to, the lane that they are trying to pick, they can't get to? Yeah, sure. So that's, yeah, that's definitely a part of your, your weekly preparation. Um, you know, number one, just to like have great snaps so we can practice in the game. Then number two, be ready for um, what type of rushes the other team is going to offer, like whether they're going to try and block the punt, set up returns, um, be aware of what kind of exotic rushes they give. And then number three, like for me, um, yeah, j definitely what you want to know what kind of return you're dealing with. There's some that like to go side to side. Um, and then there's some that like to go straight vertical downhill. Um, and then there's some, there's some even who like might make a certain move one way. Um, it, like they might always like make a move towards the boundary and then go towards the field or something like that. That, I mean, I wouldn't really study that. That's pretty complex to think about when you're running down the field. Um, but just knowing if you have like a jitterbug returner or more of a vertical returner is good to know. Right. And then this next play, so this doesn't involve you. And this, this actually, I mean, it's a, it's a Jets game. Morgan Cox, who's the long snapper for, for the, the Ravens, is a 10-year vet. Uh, he's been to the Pro Bowl a few times and is uh, a Super yeah. Bowl champ. 
Um, but he gets blown up on this play. So I kind of wanted to get your thoughts on what exactly happens. Obviously, a, a Brant Boyer special here for, for the block punt. Um, but just kind of what, what goes wrong here, and then how do you avoid this as a long snapper kind of getting trucked over like this? Yeah, sure. Yeah, Morgan Cox is like an awesome long snapper, one yeah. of the best in the league. Um, super nice guy, too. Uh, and, Bat- and Terrell Basham is also like one of the best rushers I've gone against. Uh, in practice, he like gives me fits all the time. He's really good, and he's really good practice for me. He makes me better every day. Um, but kind of here, like he's he does a great job, Basham, of like one blowing up, like hitting the snapper, and then getting upfield at the same time. Because you don't want to just like blow up the snapper with just you know no like no regard for human life, and just because then you're not you're probably not going to block the punt. Um, but he hits the snapper and then blocks the punt. Uh, but one thing I will say, like in Morgan Cox's defense to defend snappers, if you look at his left foot, he does get stepped on by the guard. Yeah, I, I did notice um, that. Yeah, that, that's very keen of you to notice that. It's, I mean, like in order to avoid this, you could kind of get your pads down a little more and get up a little more quickly and then kind of run your feet. Um, you know, it's, it's tough to say, like if the guard didn't trip him up, maybe, I, I don't know if he would have blocked him or not. Um, but for the guard, the guard's feet kind of, probably fouled him up here a little bit the guard might could probably stay straight back instead of like kind of getting in the snapper's path um but yeah it's just really a good job by you know coach Boyer and then Basham and Daniel Brown on executing the stunt and would you say because the right because the the left guard there does kind of trip him up would you say that uh because the set he takes there but the the way that he puts his right foot out there uh just so far wide it's almost like there's nothing Cox really could have done kind of get through that so would you say that he kind of takes the left guard there uh, a little bit too wide of a set yeah um yeah I mean probably like you probably want to just get straight back and not kind of go right like back into the interior um because one you could foul up that person to your right and two he kind of opens up some more space to his left um but that's just a great job by coach Boyer um he has Daniel Brown kind of like go across face across the center. And I think that kind of catches the guard's eyes and fouls him up with his, his eye, his eyes and his footwork. Um, so yeah, it's just a great job. You know, coach Boyer like draws up some great rushes and does a heck of a job. Um, but yeah, that was an exciting play. Yeah. And, and another exciting play is the, uh, I believe 53 yard field goal here against the giants, a key play in this win from you guys. And also the facet of the game, uh, part of your job that we haven't talked about yet. So uh, what would you say are some of the primary differences between snapping uh, on a field goal versus against a punt? Yeah. Um, on a field goal, like the ball is, is going lower. It's, a, prob- it's probably a little bit slower, snap, a slower of a snap. You're not throwing like as much of your whole body into it. Um, and then you're just, you're really worried about the laces. So like on a punt, I'm really worried about accuracy in my blocking field goal. I'm worried about accuracy and laces. Um, so you know, a lot of people wonder how does a snapper get laces on a field goal. And technically, your snap should spin about the same amount of rotations every time. So if you control where you hold the ball, you, that, that'll dictate how the holder catches the laces. Um, so I've just kind of, like, experimented with holding the ball in different ways. So I'm not actually grabbing the laces on this play. I'm grabbing, like, a, a panel of the ball uh, because I know by doing that, I'll get a certain amount of rotation so that lock catches the ball. Uh, or lock should catch – yeah, hopefully catches the ball with laces going forward like 99% of the time. And do you have a particular target when you're trying to do a long snap in terms of uh, just the point of the holder's body to the perfect spot for him to get that ball down? Yeah, the perfect spot is is like right, bef- right behind his hand, like that inner elbow of the elbow that's down because uh, that way you're aiming at a, a target that's not moving or like hanging in the air. Um, so just kind of like that bat, like almost like the back elbow vein, like that's what you're aiming at. And then this is a longer field goal. Uh, again, I think this was 53 yards. So are there any differences when you're snapping for a longer field goal? Because, uh, because it is longer out the trajectory, the kick might be lower, which, you know, could raise the chance of it being blocked. So the protection could be more important on a longer kick. So is there any difference in terms of uh, your snap and then getting into protection on a longer field goal like this one? Yeah, no, there's no, there's no difference for field goal. It's like the same snap every time. Um, you don't really want to think too much about it. I mean, you're definitely aware. You're definitely aware. You know, if it's an extra point or a long field goal, but it's just the same snap every time. Um, and then just kind of doing the best I can to keep my chest down 
and then lean right or left to where I feel more pressure. Right. And then in this next clip, this, which is the last clip of, of the film portion, um, this is a game winning field goal. And, you know, while the jets were for the most part out of, I mean, they were four and eight, so they're pretty much out of playoff contention. Hopefully you'll have some more game winning kicks uh, earlier in the season, or maybe in December when the jets have a better record, but who is more nervous in the situation? Let's pretend this is, you know, to go to playoffs or something. Who would be the most nervous in the situation? Is it you, the holder, or the kicker? Because if one of you three messes up, I mean, the New York sports media might, might go kind of crazy. So uh, yeah. what, what's going through your mind, I guess, as you're, as you're coming to the line? And who would you say is the most nervous out of the three of you? Um, I don't know who the most nervous is, you know. Um, I'm sure Sam has answer, answered questions on how he felt before the kick, and I'm sure he felt, he felt great. Um, but, you know, it's just kind of one of those things where you're on the sideline and you just, like, go to your routine um, and you know that, like, you, you, you want it to and you want to be ready for it to come down to you doing your job to help the team win. Um, so it's just kind of, like, you don't really think, like you said, like, about the New York media and everything. <laughs> just kind of uh, – I hope not. No, you just kind of, you know, get down and do your job. Um, I did not so great snap on field goal early in this game on an extra point. And I just kind of like put my head down and tried to bounce back um, and just have like perfect snaps after that. I didn't really let the first snap affect me. Um, so you're just yeah, doing the best you can on every snap. And as I mentioned, if, if one of you messes up, uh, the whole play could go awry. Can you kind of just speak to the importance of the three of you working as one unit? Obviously, you spend a lot of time together in practice, but specifically on field goals, you know, this long snapper to the holder and then the kicker to the holder. I mean, that's just such an important um, process. It happens, you know, hopefully multiple times in a game. Um, yeah. whether it's extra points or whatnot. Can you just kind of speak to the importance of, of the chemistry that you three must have? Yeah. I mean, there's definitely importance in the chemistry. Like I said earlier too, though, um, you do have to just like adjust extremely quickly. Like when I got traded to the Jets, like Chandler, uh, Chandler Kanzara, Lachlan and I, uh, we had a really good chemistry and I just got into the team um, and, and Chandler had a great season. Um, and I mean, Jason Myers had a great Pro Bowl season. He, he joined us late. Um, and then Sam did a very solid job for his last year. Um, right. And we, you know, we had several kickers last year. Um, so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the chemistry, I mean, the chemistry is, it, it's important. Um, you almost just have to have it though. And, you know, you definitely continue to gain it through thousands of reps together in practice. Uh, and now that we're done here with the, the film questions, we do have some more, uh, some more on the fun side here. Uh, as we close up and it was really good to just go through the film. It does not, the special teams film doesn't get enough respect. Uh, I definitely think so. It was awesome to do that. Uh, but we have yeah. some fun questions here uh, to close up. So to, to start out, I think, um, and we mentioned Morgan Cox, who, even though we brought up that clip, he's a three time pro bowler and a Super Bowl champ. So uh, in your opinion, what separates the best long snappers uh, from the average long snapper and who are some of uh, some of the best in the game right now? And just uh, over the past that you've kind of, kind of modeled your game after and looked at yeah sure um what kind of makes a great long snapper a lot of there's a lot of college snappers who if you ask them to snap in the nfl they might be able to snap with good accuracy um but then not be able to block it's really like the blocking that is the biggest adjustment from college to the pros uh right now in the in college most snappers don't block um, the college teams all kind of run those spread punt formations where you, and they have the like a swinging gate or shield in the back with three players um, who do all the protection for the punt. Um, so you just kind of snap and then get a free release downfield. And then going to the NFL where not only do you have to block, but then you're blocking like some of the best athletes in the world. Um, that's a huge, that's a huge jump. So whoever's able to like most quickly adjust to that, um, that's who the best snappers are. And then kind of c coverage is definitely a bonus on top of that. Um, so I'd say like, it's kind of like a given that you need to throw good snaps. Then two, um, you need to have great protection. And then three, if you can have some coverage, like that is a great bonus. Um, and that, that like in college, I did protect at Duke, which was one thing that helped me to be able to break into the league my first year after college. Um, one, just having that experience and then two, just getting lucky with getting some opportunities in the NFL. There's, like there's only 32 jobs. So there is an aspect of opportunity and luck to getting your chance uh, but in terms of studying snappers like Zach Diossi is like has been one of the best coverage snappers in the league over the past uh, 10 or 12 or 15 years however long he's played uh, Kurt Morgan Cox has like some of the best accuracy in the league um, it's, it you know really helps out how they, they have such a great helps with their field goal unit with Justin Tucker having 
such a phenomenal field goal percentage. Um, and he's very good in protection. Um, and then, you know, in our division, Joe Cardona, the Patriots, um, does a great job. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of snappers I have, you know, a ton of respect for. You know, Patrick Manley, he's like the OG snapper. He also – he went to Duke and played O-line there. Um, but his his snapping and protection ability is you know, second to none. Um, so, yeah, definitely all of those guys I've watched film on and look up to and have uh, modeled my game after a little bit. And a follow-up to that question, because you talk about the, the, how the snapping is basically a given, but then the tackling ability and the ability to get downfield is, is kind of what separates you in the NFL. What do you think you know, made you stand out um, to the Jets in 2017 or even to the Colts to know that, hey, this is a long snapper, but we're going to trade some assets for him because you know, we recognize that he has these gifts. What are some of the things that you thought that stood out in your training camp with the Colts or your preseason games that, that, draw, uh, that, that drew the Jets' eyes? Yeah. Um, you know, one, just like being able to protect as a rookie is pretty rare. Um, most players kind of struggle a lot with protection and they need a couple years to develop. And then, um, I mean, a lot of great snappers in the league now, it took a couple years for them to break in and they're doing a phenomenal job now. Um, the, the experience I had protecting at Duke was super helpful. And then I think you know, I'm kind of a more athletic guy, I think for a long snapper. Um, I definitely take pride in that. I take pride in like developing that in the weight room and running sprints. Um, and, you know, I just like, I just kind of have a chip on my shoulder, like work really hard, uh, lift hard um, and be in the best shape as possible. So then I'm not just like an unathletic long snapper who can throw the ball back. I want to be, I want to get as close as I can to a position player. I'm not quite, which is why I had to become a long snapper. Um, but I try my best to, to do that. All right, back, back to the fun questions. Who would you say are your closest friends on the team? Obviously, unfortunately for you, Lack Edwards probably won't be coming back this year, who I imagine you probably developed some sort of a friendship with. The Jets will most likely have a new kicker this year as well. Um, so I guess the, the three musketeers, the trio that you've probably spent a lot of your time with last year probably won't be back. So who are some of your other closest friends on, on the team? Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely friendly you know, with all the guys on the team, with um, – you sit and eat lunch with like uh, definitely a lot of the other special teams players, like um, you know, Frankie Louvu, Henry Anderson, some other guys who you talk to, uh, Brandon Copeland, who was on the team last year. Um, but like by far and away, I spend so much time with the kicker and punter um, that you definitely develop a good relationship with them. And uh, you know, Locke will be a lifelong friend um, after playing with him. Yeah. And you mentioned Brandon Copeland. There are a lot of former Colts, on the Jets right now. So uh, what do you think is part of the reason that the Jets have so many former Colts? And uh, are there any players, uh, former Colts with the team right now that you kind of remember playing with uh, during your short time uh, with in Indianapolis? Yeah, I really have no idea. I cannot give you an answer <laughs> to the Colts connection. Um, but Henry Anderson was on the team in Indy, Nate Harrison, uh, Matthias Farley, and then there's probably a couple others um, that I'm forgetting. Um, but yeah, I remember Nate Harrison was, he was drafted in, in the class where I was an undrafted rookie with the Colts. So we did like did all the rookie, um, classes together. Uh, and then Matthias Farley, he was the personal protector when I was trying to win the job in Indianapolis. And then he ended up being my personal protector last year. So that was funny to see it come full, uh, full circle. How offended would you say you are that, that Madden still does not have long snappers in the game? Yeah. I mean, yeah, they do not. They they have us in the game, but we're listed as like tight ends and centers. Yeah, what's um, that about? <laughs> yeah, uh, I know. I'm I'm honestly I'm a little offend, I'm not like too offended because it is tough to rate us in in the video game. Kind of everyone just you automatically get a perfect snap in Madden. Right. Um, that would suck to be playing and then just randomly get get kind of bad snaps. <laughs> um, and then the you know the special teams kind of graphics and uh, gameplay is not advanced enough to kind of factor in right <laughs> um, how good special teams players are uh you know even even kickers you can just you can kind of make a field goal every time with any kicker some of them might have a certain better kick distance uh but specialists as a whole the game i don't think is complex enough on the special teams front to account for that do, do players in the team play madden or like when you're on the road i mean what are some of the activities that that guys i, I guess do or, or and is madden one of them yeah i mean i i, I played a lot of madden um, we get it for free from the NFL. So like I download it in July or August when it comes out and I play, I play a good bit. I like playing online head to head. And then some guys, um, that video games are definitely one of the top hobbies among guys. Guys play FIFA, 
uh, Fortnite, Player Unknown Battleground, Call of Duty, all that stuff. But yeah, those are definitely yeah. pretty common. I've seen Le'Veon Bell's gotten pretty good at, at Super Smash Bros. Uh, according to his Instagram. So wow, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um uh mike do you have the next one yeah actually i was gonna say maybe in madden they should add because you know you already have to try to time the the kick meter and the punt meter so maybe it should be a two-step process you have to time the snap and then get the punt as well to kind of get a little more realism going yeah i'm not yeah you're definitely right that that is, that is a good idea to time something up where you have to snap perfect and then have a good block so the punt doesn't get blocked um yeah I, Mad, I don't know if players would be patient enough to deal with that. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, but most players probably don't even punt. They just go for it on fourth down. So, yeah. 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 And, and do you have, and just to kind of bounce off of the Madden question and to go back a little bit to, uh, we were talking about the film. We showed some of your tackles, but are, do you have a particular career highlight? Because I, I feel like most players, you ask, if they play a position on offense or defense, you can kind of, it's easy for us to kind of pick one out, whether it was a pick six or, a clutch touchdown or something, but uh, for you, we did show some of your tackles, but is there anything that stands out to you as a career highlight? And uh, would it maybe be something that doesn't stand out quite as obviously to us? Yeah. I mean, for career highlights, I mean, it definitely just revolves around the team winning. Um, like, you know, it's def- I-, I just want to do my part to help contribute to the team winning. Um, so like, even though on some game winning field goals uh, where I just like did the same thing I do every time, um, it was very cool to be part of the kicker, like having an awesome moment in our team winning. So like the, like Chandler hitting a game winning field goal in overtime against the Jaguars my rookie year. And then Sam hitting that field goal we just watched against the Dolphins this past year. Um, those were like, those moments felt incredible. And you know, just from like a team standpoint, and then just like individually, anytime I make a tackle, like it definitely feels great. Um, like my rookie year, I had two tackles in one game against the Browns um, and, and a forced fumble. That felt really great. Uh, in the big beginning of this season, I got off to a hot start with tackles, um, and that felt awesome. So, yeah, I definitely like getting tackles, even though it's like it's not the most important part of my job. Um, it's the most fun part. So, yeah. Would you say that you have a, a career goal for your future seasons, maybe uh, making a Pro Bowl or – uh, maybe scoring a touchdown on, on a fun, on a muffed punt or something. Is there something that you, you know, maybe in the next five years or something, you, you're hoping that you can maybe accomplish? Yeah, I don't, I don't have a goal for that per se. Um, my goal really is just to like go in every day and have great snaps and practice and games. I really just kind of take it one day at a time. I definitely think about the big picture sometimes, but um, I really just break it down day by day and week by week. Um, and hopefully that I'll look back and then be able to say some of those things and maybe something cool like that might happen. Uh, what's the worst joke somebody in the locker room has made about your last name? Um, I mean, I just get like, you need to have a sponsorship a lot. I get tired <laughs> of hearing that because I don't think NFL players are allowed to have uh, sponsorships with alcohol brands. Even the, the NFL can obviously with like all the Bud Light commercials and everything, right. uh, but we're not allowed to have that. So I get sick of hearing that. Uh, one, just because I hear it so much, and two, uh, I guess I'm kind of sad that I can't have a sponsor. <laughs> like that that would be great. Do you drink it often? No, I don't. <laughs> no, I don't. It was it was my first legal drink when I turned 21. Um, I had Hennessy, but other than that, I'm not like too big a fan of the taste. But <laughs> it's definitely funny. You have to keep a bottle around because it's my name. And speaking of taste, one of the uh, one of the tastes that the New York City area is known for is uh, it's pizza, and you grew up in Rockland County. I actually grew up pretty close to Rockland County, up in uh, in Orange County, so pretty close oh, to nice. you uh, on that yeah. side of the Hudson River. So, uh, but now you're playing with the Jets. You went to high school in New Jersey. You've been all around the New York City area. So, which which region do you think has the best pizza in the in the, in, in the entire area? Uh, and which place in particular do you think has the best pizza? Um, yeah, it's a great question. Um, I'm sure. That's a pretty hot topic. I'm sure everyone kind of has a heated opinion. Yeah, tread lightly that. I mean, I, I can just tell you, like, different region. I mean, pizza just tastes really good. So, like, anytime yeah. you have an amazing slice, you might leave and say, like, that was the best slice I ever had. So, there's probably been a couple times where I've said that. Uh, but up in Rockland County, Napoli's is really good. Um, I think the episode of Sopranos was filmed there. It's, uh, it's right on Route 304. They have a really good buffalo chicken slice. Um, I lived in Jersey City for, for during my second year with the Jets, 
and Porta Porta Pizza is really good. It's like wood fired Neapolitan pizza. Um, and then out here in Florham Park, um, I've had Nona's Pizza and Pomodoro, um, and those are both phenomenal. So yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the Sopranos, as I, I think I've rewatched the the whole series at least three times now. Uh, got through another one in this this quarantine, so I've been making good use of my time. But uh, yeah. Maybe, maybe you saw uh, today that the Rams released their new uniforms. I, I won't ask you to comment on them because they're pretty bad. Um, but what are your thoughts on the Jets' new uniforms? Because, uh, I mean, they were met with some, some backlash online by, by some people. But once you got to see them in action, and Michael and I were fans from, from the beginning, I mean, we really liked the uniforms. So what are your thoughts on, on the new unis? As you saw at the film review going back and forth between the, the traditional look and then the, the, the new, year, uh, the new uh, look that they broke out this past year. Yeah, I mean, I think they look great. Like. Um, I like the, the new brighter green, the black jerseys are awesome and the, um, the green helmets are really cool. So yeah, I, I think they look great. Yeah. I, I definitely don't understand how anyone could have critiqued them. I just think they're awesome. Uh, but yeah. to move on from that, uh, can you do any sort of, or have you ever tried to do any sort of long snapping tricks? I know there's a video I saw last year, uh, of you doing the, the bottle top challenge. Uh, with the long snapping, is there anything else you've tried to do or you think you can do or maybe would want to do? Yeah. Um, I mean, I did, uh, you know, I mean, the true mark of a good snapper is just kind of like snapping your 14 yards on, on punt and then your eight yards on field goal. I did the bottle cap challenge. I had a bunch of friends kind of hit me up um, after a couple other snappers did it. Like, you need to do this. And then I got tired of hearing it and just I did it in one of my practice sessions one day. I really did get it on the first try. But it is also not that hard to do. I mean, we did loosen the cap a little. It would be physically impossible to make it come off without doing that. Um, and then you just kind of have to snap it, like throw a good snap, um, and you'll knock it off. Um, so, yeah. But in, in college, I did a couple. I, like, snapped a ball off the top of our stadium into a trash can. Um, and that's on my Instagram account. Dang. All right, last question for you, Thomas. You've been so gracious with your time. We really appreciate it. What's the one thing that you want people to know about long snappers? Are they people, too? Yeah, yeah, there's definitely people too. Um, I mean, I guess I just want them to know how hard we work at our craft, how hard a lot of guys work off the field. Um, and I think for the most part, long snappers tend to be pretty smart guys off the field who are definitely involved in off, off, the, field, off the field activities. And I think, honestly, most NFL players are. I think most NFL players um, are a lot smarter than, than people think and have a lot more interests and hobbies off the field um, that are really cool. And that's one thing I've learned from getting up close and personal with players in the locker room is how interesting every guy is. There's so many different stories, so many different backgrounds. Um, and yeah, long snappers are definitely part of that. Well, yeah, I know you're, you're definitely a bright off the field. You went to Duke, which is a terrific uh, college, but I can't say I love their, their basketball program too much. I, I apologize. But um, yeah, that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> you, you could follow Thomas Hennessy at T Henny 43 on Twitter. Uh, make sure to shoot him a follow. We got to get your followers up, Thomas. I mean, you got to start tweeting some fire uh, stuff that we can retweet. Yeah, I'm, lack I'm definitely lacking on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, long snappers are definitely trying to be seen, not heard. Um, I mean, <laughs> obviously, there's the cliche about you don't want to hear long snappers' names. Um, I mean, there's a little truth to that, but it also is cool to be known for whatever it is, getting tackles and maybe doing something cool off the field. Uh, but yeah, I appreciate you taking a shot at my Twitter follower account. <laughs> um, I'll try to get that up. <laughs> well, again, we appreciate you coming on. Um, we hope everything's uh, safe at home and that you're staying inside and staying healthy. Uh, and then best of luck with this year. Hopefully that there is some sort of season this year. And uh, uh, I'm looking forward. I, Thomas, I, I do really think that you have a shot at the Pro Bowl uh, coming up soon. I, we might yeah, we're we're going to get him there. We're going to make sure it happens. We're going we're gonna to lead the campaign to get Thomas Hennessy to the Pro Bowl because your consistency uh, is pretty outstanding. So uh, just, just looking forward to, to watching your career with the Jets uh, over the next few years. And, uh, but, again, stay, uh, stay healthy, and, and thank you for, for coming on the show. Yeah, I appreciate it, guys. Um, I'm definitely, like, very impressed with your, your willingness to learn more about special teams and, and promote some of the finer points of the game. That's pretty awesome. You don't really see that in the mainstream media. Um, so I think it's really cool that you guys do that. Um, and definitely keep the pro, the pro Thomas content. Coming. <laughs> uh, but yeah. we'll, we'll start a hashtag. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks All right, guys. Well, th All right. Thank you, Thomas. All right. And that was Thomas Hennessy, the long snapper for the New York jets. Uh, again, we really appreciate him taking time uh, to come on our show. Uh, you can follow us at CYJ pod on Twitter. You can follow myself at Ben W Blessington and you can follow Michael at Michael underscore Nania. Um, uh, you can find our show at jetsxfactor.com. 
Uh, half of this episode will be up on YouTube and then the other half will be uh, only audio uh, as premium content. Um, but the whole audio version will be on iTunes. So you can find us there on, and on Spotify. Um, but uh, yeah, really cool stuff from Tom, Thomas Hennessy there. Uh, was was uh, pretty uh, intrigued by some of the stuff he said there, Michael. Yeah, it just uh, to, to hear from him that he is impressed with our uh, intrigue and special teams is uh, that's definitely going up as a life accomplishment, a life memory. So that, I, I that's, want to that's be, pretty awesome. Pretty I awesome. didn't want to be too demeaning to, to ourselves and let him know that we, we don't have a life. So we're fully <laughs> uh, ready to sit down and analyze um, some special teams, some special teams clips. But um, uh, yeah, again, just thank you guys for listening. Uh, hope everybody's doing well. We'll have we have a few more of these film sessions planned. I mean, we're really enjoying doing them. We've been in contact with some other Jets players. Some, some Jets players we're really excited about. Um, so we'll have a few more of these coming out. Um, I mean, everybody's stuck inside, and everybody's getting pretty acquainted with Zoom. So uh, yeah. that works uh, in our favor. And then we'll have uh, some other content coming out. Obviously, the Jets have made some moves uh, and could make even uh, some more free agent moves with uh, Larry Warford or potentially Logan Ryan. But they did sign Frank Gore, so – We'll have a podcast uh, coming out in the next few weeks, kind of just breaking down some of the post-draft um, news that's come out. But we'll continue pumping out these film sessions and these uh, these interviews, and hopefully that'll take us right towards uh, you know training camp and preseason if there there is one. But Michael, any last words before we go? Uh, get Thomas Hennessy to the Pro Bowl. Keep what the Pro the Thomas content coming. T uh, Henny Pro Bowl yeah. is that is that what the the new hashtag will be? T Henny for Pro Bowl. I think that works. I think that works. We could, right. I think we can do better than that, though. I'm not going to settle for that. We're we, going to come we up. We're going to come up with something, and we're going to we're going to get it going. I'm not I'm not going to just settle on something right now because this, <laughs> is, this is an important matter that deserves okay. more attention. When we promote this episode on Twitter, we'll we'll, we'll include the the hashtag that we want uh, pumped out throughout the season because his consistency is pretty. And you even hearing about like the the rotation on field goals, how it has to be perfect yeah. every time. I didn't even think about stuff like that. But um, really cool to sit down and talk with them. Really cool guy. And and thanks again to him. Uh, for for coming on our show but that'll do it for us again stay healthy stay indoors and and hope everybody's um doing well through this time uh, we'll, we'll try to keep pumping out some jets content and then hopefully uh we'll uh, keep marching our way towards uh, the jets 2020 season thanks <laughs>